Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the April 22nd, 2020 meeting of the Murfreesboro Planning Commission. This is our meeting that was originally scheduled for April 8th, 2020. In accordance with executive order number 16 issued by Governor Bill Lee, the Murfreesboro Planning Commission's April 22nd, 2020 meeting will be conducted electronically and there will not be physical, um, there will not be physical public access to the meeting as necessary to protect public health, safety and welfare in light of the coronavirus. The public may view the meetings electronically through Murfreesboro City TV, which is broadcast on Comcast, Xfinity channels three and 1094 and on AT&T Uverse channel 99. The meeting can also be streamed on Roku, YouTube, Facebook and the city's website. Uh, all of this has been advertised uh, to the public and all of the instructions were given within the advertisement on how the public could call in to participate in this meeting. So with all of that, we will call our meeting to order and uh, for determination of a quorum, I believe we will call the roll. Jacob, if you could call the roll for us. Did I hear Ms. Garland? Present. Pre present. Thank you. Ken Halliburton? Present. Mr. Martin? Present. Mr. Russell? Present. Thank you. Mr. Silas? Present. Mr. Smotherman? Present. Thank you. Okay, so we do have a quorum present for our meeting and I believe we need to take a vote to hold this meeting electronically. Do we need a motion for that, uh, Mr. McKnight, or are we just gonna take the vote? So moved. Second. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Ms. Jones, Aye. All, all votes will need to be done by roll call. Right. And is Ms. Jaco doing all of the roll call? Yes, ma'am, as long as her audio holds up. Okay, we're good. Ms. Jaco. Let me, uh, I, I'll do it this time and we'll see if we can get Carolyn back up. Ms. Garland. Aye. Mr. Halliburton. Aye. Mr. Salas. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Mr. Smother. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. Madam Chair. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Our next item that we need to take care of will be to approve the minutes of the February 19th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. And just need to see if anybody had any additions, corrections to the minutes as submitted. And if not, we'll take a motion to approve those minutes and then we'll ask for a roll call again. So moved. Second. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Roll call, please. Ms. Garland? Aye. Mr. Halliburton? Aye. Mr. Martin? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Silas? Aye. Mr. Smutterman? Aye. Thank you. And aye. 
I approve as well. So that motion passes. And uh, next we will move into our new business. Our first item under new business this evening is a zoning request for a planned signage overlay uh, district program book for New Vision Baptist Church for approximately 30 acres along North Thompson Lane, West College Street and West Northfield Boulevard. New Vision Baptist Church is the applicant. Ms. Stevens. Good evening. I'm Teresa Stevens, the city sign administrator. We're going to be looking today at an application to create a plan sign overlay district. The zoning ordinance allows plan overlay districts in keeping with the promotion and protection of the public health, safety, comfort, and convenience standards set forth by the city to permit the use of new and innovative signs on large atypical developments. The city encourages the design and development of signs that are highly higher quality than would be under the sign ordinance and to provide the aesthetic and architectural improvements in the total planning of large tra land tracts. Also to promote signs which are compatible with their surroundings and to provide an option to the existing sign ordinance. To be eligible for a planned sign overlay district, the development must consist of 20 acres or more and be zoned appropriately. The subject property is located at 1750 North Thompson Lane. The property consists of three parcels, the largest being 24.15 acres, the parking lot addition of 3.55 acres, an accessory parcel of 2.33 acres located south of the largest parcel for a total of 30.3 acres, 0 0.03 acres. The property is zoned RS-15 and has an institutional group assembly use, which is permitted by a special use permit approved by the BZA. Institutional group assembly is permitted for a plan sign overlay district in any zone. The purpose of the plan sign overlay district is to allow the applicant an opportunity to present a cohesive plan for the entire project that addresses everything from permanent building signage to temporary signs. The property has three existing freestanding signs, one per entry. The proposed plan sign overlay district would allow the additional freestanding signs on the property at building entrances, increased size for routing signs and parking lot intersections, attached building signs, canopy signs that extend beyond the canopy surface and string lighting around the outdoor assembly areas. There's also a proposed mural on three elevations of, at the rear and side of the building, as well as some temporary signage. I have provided additional information located in your packet that provides a comparison table from the current sign ordinance to the planned sign overlay proposal for each type of sign. New Vision Baptist Church representative Regina Thompson is here with us from Visionary Studios and will make a brief presentation regarding the planned sign overlay district. Good evening. Uh, this is Regina Thompson with Visionary Studios. Uh, we're the architects working with New Vision on the plans signage overlay and um, what Matthew's got on the screen and, and you, Matthew you can just kind of sum through the whole set if you want um, is basically the full package that we're submitting to you all. Um, when New Vision hired us um, we always like to go out and experience their property on a Sunday so we can see what the guest experience is coming onto campus and getting into the building and one thing that we noticed is that there's not a uh, good defined main entrances into the building and so that's what kind of has gotten us to a point where we needed to talk to you all is um, part of the um, entrance um, sequence is having good signage to help define where those main entrances are um, and so that's kind of what we're presenting to you now um, another thing that um, Ms. Stevens mentioned is on the what used to be more of the rear of the building um, is getting to be more exposed to the public because um, of the new West Northfield Road and the children's uh, hospital that's behind it. Um, and so we've suggested putting a mural on that building so that um, it just improves the appearance of it. Uh, so this is our present presentation to you all. Any questions about 
what uh, what we've got in the set, um, basically just new entrances, um, new um, signage, um, basically any signage that's at the um, roadway would match their existing monument signs. Um, we've got some, as this is showing, some uh, string lights that we're suggesting in a certain area of that property. Um, we've got canopy signs over the main entry locations and um, have set it up in this package for the uh, PCO. Okay, if that is the um, end of our presentation at this point, if any of the Planning Commission members uh, have any specific questions they would like to ask, uh, I, I, we will open the public hearing in just a minute. I don't believe we've had any requests to, uh, from the public for this particular item, uh, but we will still open the public hearing shortly, but questions from Planning Commission members. I have a question. This is Jennifer Garland. Uh, I'm referring to sheet 3.3, where the mural sign is shown. Yes. Yeah. Just, just out of curiosity, maybe some feedback from the staff on how murals are being addressed. And we're seeing this pop up more and more in cities. I'm curious if there are any particular guidelines around that. Um, there are not at this point other than they're excluded from per sign permits if they're considered strictly a mural. Um, we go by our sign definition to try to uh, differentiate between what would be considered a mural and what would be considered a sign. And so the definition that we have adopted, the city has adopted is for in the sign ordinance is for mural is painting or graphics applied directly to a wall or permanent surface other than a window, which contains no advertising material. We feel like this falls under that. Um, right now, uh, there are some, when I say there's no ordinance for murals, there, there are some guidelines in our sign ordinance that say you can't have murals on more than two sides of the building and it cannot be on the front of the building. So um, that's why we, included a mural in this plan sign overlay because they are asking for three sides just you can look at the um that she and see the the green dotted lines is where the mural will be so technically that you, you've got three sides covered even though they're all facing the rear of the building um that's what we've included in this plan sign overlay because it does vary from what is permitted and just so you know about that building that's a, a pre-engineered metal building with just metal siding and so um, now that it's being more exposed before this was just an alleyway that only the church really had access to and visibility of but with the west northfield road come in and the children's hospital and also that new parking that they've added on that side of the property, this side of the building has become a lot more visible and we're sure that the city isn't very interested in seeing the pre-engineered metal building that's there. So um, that's why we're recommending that the mural be put on it to just improve the appearance of it. And that last portion was Regina speaking. I don't know if you all can yeah. see that. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Garland, and thank you all for your feedback on that. Um, I, I, I also, that was uh, one of the two pages that I had questions about. Um, I do like the idea of the mural on the back of that building, um, just for the very reasons that you mentioned, that it is now uh, much more visible uh, to the general public, and it was not before. Um, but I, I was concerned about the actual signage on the mural. 
Um, and I did wonder uh, how staff was looking at that and you know, whether the rest of the planning commission feels like that's part of what we want to allow. I mean, I, I guess we can approve most anything in a planned signage overlay district. Uh, and, and that's the whole idea is, is getting a, a few things that you might not otherwise. Um, but I, I just, I had a little bit, I was taken aback a little bit by, by this particular mural. So just thoughts and comments. Um, this is Regina Thompson uh, with Visionary. Um, just to kind of let you know that the image that's shown on this sheet is just um, a rendering. It's not the final result. Um, the church will need to work with a muralist to actually design the mural. Um, this was just kind of a placeholder just to kind of give the church an idea of what could happen there. This isn't necessarily what will happen. Okay, and so then the actual mural itself, would that come back for uh, an amendment to the plan signage overlay book or staff, how would that, how would that work? Well, this would, the, a mural is the, probably the first time we've, that I'm aware that was, it's been part of plan sign overlay. Of course, even though we approve the plan sign overlay, it still comes through the regular application process, um, just like anything else. And I, I think uh, Robert Holtz and I discussed it and thought about um, if, it, if it varied greatly from that, then we would definitely recommend taking it back through. I, um, when Regina and I discussed it, we were hoping that it would be the, you know, the muted tones and the, and the colors, not anything that would be drastically different. Um, also with the new vision uh, emblem, I, we did have her measure that out so we could um, make sure that we address that because I, I knew that would, it's always the area, not just from um, plan sign overlay, but anytime we're looking at a mural, the, that question can, can come up. So. This is uh, Eddie Smotherman speaking. Uh, just a question on page 10, um, Matthew, if you could flip down a couple of pages. Right there. Yeah. Uh, did they consider perhaps going with something that had more consistency if they're planning on doing an addition like this? Would it be better to, rather than have a mural, just have a design that matches the new edition? I mean, is, is that something that was considered? Um, this is Regina Thompson. So on this sheet, this is another example of, so we did a master plan for them. And so this was some renderings that we did for future edition that may or may not happen. And so we're just using that future edition as a, a possible scenario so that they can um, plan for future signage that might be needed on that edition. I understand, but rather than just having a different uh, type of, um, um, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, extrusion or something coming, the, 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 the additional added on section to the building, is there any desire to create consistency amongst those? And if so, I think it would be a good time to establish that trend with this particular design. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to be a wrap or something probably anyways. And uh, for consistency's sake, I think the building would look nicer if it were um, just uh, a, more, a more consistent design going around the building as opposed to a mural on one side and perhaps a, a different uh, design uh, deviating from the brick structure on the other side. Um, yeah, that, that can happen. Um, really all that we're trying to do on this is just um, plan for future attached signs um, the building itself isn't um, something that's being 
um, designs. Now, uh, the only part of this that was a mural is the their logo with that kind of light gray semi-circular element. The rest of it is either uh, channel signs or, um, yeah, I think we basically were planning on channel signs or backlit signs is what the rest, basically where it says New Vision and New Vision Kids. So this is the future kids building. So, you know, obviously we wanted it to kind of stand out as a separate element from the rest of the building so that it kind of spoke to children. Um, but, you know, this hasn't been something that's been asked to be designed at this point. It's just um, mainly just planning for that future signage need. So, so I would think a, a building addition is going to come back before us for that addition. Um, and yeah. we have to look at signage again at that time and, and a modification or an amendment to this document that we're trying to approve today. This is Warren. Is the mural actually going to be a uh, vinyl wrap or is it going to be painted? Painted. Thank you. I do have a couple other questions. I think if y'all don't mind, I'm going to just uh, go ahead and open the public hearing just in case we've had anybody call in or anything for that. And so we will just open the public hearing and see if anyone has called in or um, let staff know that they wanted to speak on this item. Ms. Jones, we uh, advertised this and gave people until uh, who, who wish to participate in the public hearings until noon today to register and uh, no one registered to speak or participate in this particular public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Blomley. So we will close the public hearing and then continue any questions um, and concerns from the planning mission. And I'm gonna go ahead and mention my one other uh, item that I had a question about, which was on page nine, just uh, right before this one. And it was the flag signs. Um, it says uh, the last item under flag sign general notes under the, the lower, the bottom picture says um, two per entrance to property used for two week time period. Um, and said the images will vary based on the event and the time of the year. And my only concern was and question is uh, does this mean that these signs can go up every two weeks and change so that would we see 26 different signs a year uh, with these flag signs? I mean, are they going to be consistently out there or is there any time limit or anything as to the number of times they can change out these signs or just every two weeks they change and put something new and different out there? This is Regina Thompson again. So at this point, the church is not interested in using flag signs. Um, but when we were um, explained the purpose of the PSO, it was to make sure that any future signs are planned for. And so this sheet was planning for future possible signs. Um, I don't see that there would be any reason why the church would do it, you know, every week. Um, I see this you know, mainly just like it's showing on this sheet is um, for like vacation Bible school. If they have that, that would be something. Um, but um, I, I don't know if um, Greg um, Freeman, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, this is Greg Freeman. Uh, what Regina said is correct. We don't have any uh, intention whatsoever to have flag signs in any kind of permanent basis. Okay, thank you very much for answering that question. Any other questions from the rest of the Planning Commission? I have a follow-up question. This is Jennifer Garland to that. I still think it's just not quite clear. If I read it to say that two weeks out of the year, the flag signs could be up. Um, and I think it's a big difference if we're gonna allow it to be part of the PSO and it's not really intended to be utilized. It, it needs to be clear if it's two weeks out of the year, year or if it's 
every week that it just, as long as they change design, it's okay. And I really have the same question for the banner above that says uh, that the banner could be used at each entrance for three for a three month time period. So that tells me again, I read it to say a, a banner can be up for a total of three months out of the year at each entrance. And this is Regina Thompson. Uh, uh, Ms. Stevens, um, what is the standard language for these type of signs? Do we need to change how our language is? Well, under the current sign ordinance, there is no time limit on temporary signs. Um, the flag, the flag signs could be up 365 days a year, as long as they're of temporary nature. Um, we we don't currently have a uh, an ordinance that limits it to one month, two months, three months. They're just temporary and they have to be maintained from fading, ripping, tearing, those kind of um, maintenance things that come up. Uh, the same thing with the banners or other temporary signs. The <clears throat> only temporary signs that we limit are like event or we call them directional signs. Like we see maybe for like a an auction or 5k kind of that has a date on it and uh, inflatables and those are you can have those once a year for I believe three or seven days I can't remember so this is really more restrictive than what we currently have Okay, any other uh, questions from Planning Commission members or staff? Mr. Blomley? Yes, ma'am, thank you, uh, Ms. Jones. I just wanted to mention that for any future buildings um, that may not have been submitted yet that are shown in this, in this package, I just wanted to clarify that um, what we are looking at in this package is the signage, any architecture of the buildings, um, any building design other than the signage uh, would be subject to um, separate review of those elevations during the site plan review process. And I'm sorry, this is Jennifer again. I'm still not quite clear on the flags. Can they be up 52 weeks out of the year or can they be up two weeks out of the year? I think we need to get some clarification language in there on both of those signs, the banner sign and the uh, flag signs, because uh, just like Ms. Garland said, I mean, I. I read it originally the exact opposite way of the way she read it. I, I read it, they could be up 365 days a year. They just have to change them every two weeks and or every, you know, we'd have four different banner signs, but they'd be there all year long for three months at a time, which, you know, that's not what I think we want to see. So I think we'd rather see a little bit more restrictive language in there would be my thoughts. I'll be happy to change it. And then I guess staff would um, determine, help them with that wording so that it's, you know, I, I don't want to say you can only do it two weeks a year, but I just, I don't want to see it constant uh, or two weeks up, two weeks down, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Just as, as needed, definitely vacation Bible school, you know, those things like that, that you want to make sure people, um, it stands out for them. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from planning commission and or staff? Ms. Jones, this is David Ives. Would it make sense to uh, say that the flags could be used for two-week time periods for special events? Would that be, I'm, I'm not sure that's, do we know what a special event is? I, I guess a, a large church could have a special event every two weeks, but uh, just a thought that of a way to perhaps limit it to get some other, some, some intent in there that, that they're not to be up every, 
new new flags every two weeks. I think as it reads right now, you could come in with new flags every two weeks. David, would it be okay if we put a uh, wording in there that said something like uh, for any two week uh, any two weeks chosen between a three month period so that technically four times out of the year, they could put them up for three months or two weeks during a three month period. But, uh, but that would limit it to uh, basically, you know, a three month period. I guess you could wind up technically putting it up for four weeks almost in a row. But if you did, that would take up six months of your time period that you'd be able to have them by the roadway. I think we can write up something like that if that is the sense of uh, uh, the Planning Commission and if that uh, doesn't mean with too terribly much resistance from the applicants. I, I think for my concerns that would certainly help and Ms. Garland, did you have comments on that? I, I like Mr. Smotherman's suggestion. It's it just, again, it's one of those things, you know, setting a precedent, you know, uh, and it, I completely understand, you know, wanting to advertise the VBS and, and, and other special events. And it is a place of assembly, which is different than, uh, you know, a retail store, but a retail store might stand up and argue that, you know, their sale of the week is a special event. And so we just have to be cautious, I think, about precedent. Agreed. Any any other comments and questions from the Planning Commission members? Uh, uh, David, again, uh, another question, do you want us to try to put in some kind of similar limitation on the banners, which, because, you know, you're, I think you're correct as it reads now, uh, you could put up a new banner every three months. Agree. Now, under our uh, and our my recollection, our definition in the sign ordinance of banners is there's like two per lot, but there's not a time limit except in this CBD. Is that, is that right, Teresa? Do you, you recall? That's correct. You can have, for a banner attached to a building, um, you can have 120 square feet, and they can be up. There's no time limit. Uh, for a freestanding, if not otherwise regulated sign, which is what you see mostly with the hardback, like for leasing, um, those can be 32 square feet and they, they don't have a time limit either. Mr. Ives, do you think you, you all can come up with a similar similar wording on that that's going to allow them to do what they, they want to do, but, but not have it be up 365 days a year? We'll certainly work with the applicants. Teresa and I and Robert uh, Holtz will work with the applicant on that, and, and I believe we'll be able to come up with something that uh, uh, with, which will put some limitation on it to give us some some better sense of security and also give them opportunity to uh, uh, to take care of the uh, their their events as they need to. Greg, just or I'm sorry, um, under the uh, banner part of it, would it be possible just to allow them to have a banner for three months, any time period during each year? Would that correct the situation as far as the uh, limitation of allowing them to have it up for three months, but uh, to technically um, not have it up for an entire year or having one up for three months and taking it down and putting a different banner up in the same spot for the next uh, three months. I guess that's a question for you, David. I think we can we can write up something to that that, that would uh, speak in that generally like that. Yes. And Ms. Thompson, do you think that can uh, we can work that out uh, to 
take care of what the applicant needs. I mean, we want to try to allow them to have the banners and the flags when they need them, but just try not to take advantage or, or overstep on that. Can we, do you feel good about working on that? Yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll work with the church on that and, and also um, Ms. Stevens and the rest of the staff. Wonderful. Thank you. Any other comments or concerns on this item from the other planning commission members or Ms. Garland or Mr. Smotherland, anything further? If there are no other questions or comments, I would move for approval subject staff uh, uh, participation in uh, revising the wordage on the banners and the uh, flag signs, feather signs, I guess they are. This is Ken Halliburton. I'll second that motion. motion. And if I could just ask for clarification, are we uh, on the motion, are we uh, making any any further comment regarding the mural wall? Or I guess, do we want to see the actual mural that they're going to put up before or, or see a, a, what that's going to look like? Or I, didn't, I didn't include that in the motion, but I do think that it would be nice if we could see what the mural is going to be before it goes on to the structure. So uh, the the modified motion, Mr. Halliburton, do you second that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Jaco. Hi, Mr. Blomley. Yes, I, I just wanted to get some clarification on the second part of the motion regarding the mural. Um, and here, here are my thoughts on that. Um, so it comes back as uh, not as a function of the of the zoning plan. In other words, going back through a four or five month process, unless unless um, unless it's substantially different, but it comes back to you uh, at like a regular day meeting uh, for your review and approval, as opposed to an amendment to the PSO, unless unless it's substantially different. That kind of along the lines of what y'all were thinking. It is me, Mr. Smotherman, it's your motion. Uh, yes, that's definitely my intention. And, uh, you know, my, I think our whole approach to this is uh, this property is visible from the battlefield. And I think there's certain things that probably be um, perhaps too intrusive or stand out too much. Uh, but uh, I think what they presented is probably acceptable. But uh, it means they said that that was not chiseled in stone as far as what they were going to use. I think that it would be advantageous for them to come back during a day meeting uh, yeah. just to show us what it is they're planning on putting on that building. Thank you for the clarification. I think that that language to specify that. Okay, so the motion as clarified and the second by Mr. Halliburton. Ms. Jaco. Ms. Garland. Aye. Mr. Halliburton. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. Mr. Silas. Aye. And Chair Jones. Aye. I miss Mr. Smotherman. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Motion passes. We appreciate y'all's help on this. Um, and so we're ready to move on, I believe, to item B. This item is a zoning application for approximately 1.44 acres located at the northeast corner of Gold Valley Drive and North Rutherford Boulevard to be rezoned from PCD to PRD as Rutherford Corner PRD 
Masterson Homes, Inc. is the applicant. Ms. Kerr. Ms. Jones, I am going to um, present this one on behalf of Ms. Kerr. So I'll try to do her proud. Um, uh, as she put in a lot of work on this particular application. This is a rezoning request. The property is currently zoned PCD, and it was zoned PCD around 2008 um, for um, the development of an office building on the property. Um, development with that, with that office building never moved forward. Um, the applicant at that time was the same as is the applicant for this particular application, Mr. Masterson. Mr. Masterson has owned that property for quite some time and uh, with no bites <clears throat> on building an office there, he is looking to do something with that property other than have it sit there vacant. And so he is requesting a rezoning to a PRD, Land Residential District, for a small townhome development. Um, property is located at the northeast corner of North Rutherford Boulevard and Gold Valley Drive. It's right at the entrance to the Woodchase subdivision. You can see the Woodchase subdivision is zoned RS10. Pull up the aerial photo. So you see that there are single family residences directly to the east of the subject property, as well as to the south of the subject property across Gold Valley Drive. To the north is zoned RM12, I believe, along Willowbrook Drive, and those are um, either apartments or townhomes located along Willowbrook Drive. To the west, directly across North Rutherford Boulevard is St. Mark's United Methodist Church, which is zoned RS15. And to the southwest of the subject property is zoned PRD, is the Stratford Place and Stratford Hall residential developments. The applicant, as I mentioned, has requested to rezone the property to PRD for a, an eight unit townhome development. I'll show you the future land use map. Future land use map recommends that the property develop as parks. Um, the city does not own this property. And so it's, uh, if I had to guess the, the reason why it was identified as parks is because um, at the north, west corner of the property or the northwest quadrant of the property. Um, the big ditch runs through. That's what what we called it throughout the years. I believe it's called Garrison Creek now. Um, but uh, but Mr. Masterson owns that. The city does not own it. And um, it's already entitled for office development, which is not uh, consistent with the parks recommendation of the Murfreesboro 2035 future land use map. The proposed development that Mr. Rob Mulchan with SCC will give you a presentation on momentarily is more consistent with the auto urban general residential uh, future land use uh, character, which um, is for single family attached and detached uh, dwelling units um, of a density of about three and a half to eight and a half dwelling units per acre. I believe the development that he proposes is about five and a half dwelling units per acre. So with that being said, I will, um, unless the Planning Commission has any questions for me at the present moment, um, I'll ask Mr. Rob Mulchan to make a brief presentation um, on behalf of his client. Thank you, Matthew. Members of the Planning Commission, Rob Mulch and SEC, uh, here tonight on behalf of uh, David Masterson and Masters of Homes to present to you our request to modify or should it say change the zoning classification from PCD to PRD on this property. As Matthew talked about, Mr. Masterson has owned this property for a very long time. The 2008 rezoning to PCD has kind of sat around waiting for someone to come by and pick it up, and it hasn't happened today. So Mr. Masterson feels that a townhome development is possibly the next best uh, uh, mixed uh, to tie into this residential corridor of Rutherford on this side. So with that, I'm going to go through some slides and give you a little, little overview of it. Um, we talked about there's a site there in the northeast corner of Rutherford and Gold Valley Drive. Next slide. 
uh, Matthew talked about, there are the different zoning classifications in regards to the R, to the townhomes that are slash apartments that are to the north, single family on our east and southern, southern side, church across the street, and then you've also got Stratford Hall and Stratford Place across the street on the southwest side over there. We talked about there, we're looking at this in regards to the uh, auto urban residential character uh, that does allow up to eight. Uh, over eight units to the acre. We're only looking at five and a half units to the acre on this 1.4 acre parcel of land. Just a couple quick uh, slides show you some of the residential character that's around the around the actual development itself. As you can see there, some of the homes on Go Valley Drive and also the back sides of the townhomes on the north side of the property give you a little character feel for what's going on out there. The plan itself, as you can see, we've got eight townhome units, so roughly about um, 1,900 square foot per unit. Uh, they are two stories. Uh, we've got three different buildings. Uh, this site was rather difficult to try to make this thing work. We do have a large uh, utility easement for stormwater and also a sanitary sewer easement. You can see crossing from Red Oak Court over to Garrison Creek on that side. So we had an encumbrance in the middle along with the drainage easement on the right hand side. Besides also having the Garrison Creek stream buffers as part of this. So we did a lot of work with staff to try to figure out the best way to kind of get this thing all worked out. But you can see we got two, three unit buildings on this, one of which we have faces is actually the front of the building actually faces across Garrison Creek back out towards North Rutherford. The other two buildings face on Gold Valley Drive and give a very good presentation in regards to that side architecturally. Uh, we will be utilizing these private driveways here to get back to the uh, behind the units. These will be rear entry garage units, single car rear entry garage units with an additional parking space outside the garage and also nine extra, nine extra uh, guest spaces in there. So we're exceeding our parking ratio by about seven extra car spaces above and beyond what we're required to for the bedroom count. These will be two bedrooms and all the units on that side. Um, you can see we also have an area for trash enclosure cart and centrally located next to the building on the right hand side. We have a formal open space, more like a brick paver plaza area with a pergola, just a nice little gathering space for those residents that you know, take up ownership on these homes. And these will be for sale townhomes on that side as well. So um, more or less on that side. The architecture itself, all masonry products, um, primarily brick with some accents to kind of help break, you know, break up the the units that kind of help accentuate the differences units on that side. You can see this is one of the three one of the three uh, unit buildings, uh, brick on the edge on the two units on the, on the edges, and then the internal middle building will have some kind of brick and or hardy type of material to help break it up and accentuate the different uh, architectural facades on that side. And this is the character of the back up, one. and that's what the two the two unit building will look like on that side. So you can see the back of these are very, you know, they've got, we got the carriage doors with the windows. We've got little uh, uh, pedestrian doors with uh, little awnings over top of that on that side. So a very good presentation on all sides of the building itself. Go forward. Uh, talking about amenities, like I said, this is like I said, we do have a very, you know, very, very good quantity of open space in this. We actually have open space on the property that includes Garrison Creek, of course, and then there's also a little drainage way along at the corner there as well that leads into Garrison Creek. So we're uh, well above and beyond open space requirements. We're actually about 65% of this property is some form of green space, whether that's a uh, actual usable green space in regards to the plaza I talked about or detention but also the creek way itself. This will, the next slide will be showing just a little bit of a blow up in regards to those amenities that we're talking about putting in there and kind of how centrally located you have your mail kiosks there uh, identified by the letter C just to the north of the plaza and development signage out there on Gold Valley Drive besides the little formal court area we're proposing on the side. So I think that's, uh, appreciate your time, consideration of this and um, available for any questions now or after public hearing. Okay, are there any questions for Mr. Mulchan or any of the staff before we open the public hearing? I know we did have one potential <clears throat> uh, person that would like to speak on this item. So if there's no questions, we will go ahead and open the public hearing. See if there's anyone at all that would like to speak on this particular item. Um, Mr. Wally, I don't care. I don't know if we had anybody. Call me. I did check the waiting room and we currently don't have anyone called in uh, for the public hearing. Okay, then we will close the public hearing.
and ask for questions and comments from the planning commission. I, of course, do have one question, just want a clarification. Um, on page 14 in our uh, book, you know, when you reference um, the examples of brick and the stone veneer, the fiber cement board siding, um, just a little section off to the right there, mm -hmm. uh, they all say different colors, cuts, and patterns will be allowed. And I take it if we allow something like that in a pattern book, that we're just talking about a very minor change. You know, if you go to purchase this particular one and it's now been replaced or a newer version of it, or, you know, and we're not gonna see substantially different colors, cuts, and patterns in all of these. Oh, no, I, but, I, page numbers. I, 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 what I printed. On that page on the right, where it says the example of the brick, the different colors, cuts, and patterns that will be allowed, and it states that on each of those items, uh, just wanted to make sure that when we have that in the pattern book that we're only talking about very minor changes uh, if we're going to allow anything different other than what's in the pattern book. Is that... I just don't remember normally seeing that in our pattern book. Miss Jones, if I can speak, that's normally what we do have in our pattern books that we put in there, just because at this level, we kind of have an idea about what type of materials we're planning on putting on, the, on these structures. Uh, colors and such like that are you know, hard to define exactly what the color is going to be in regards to that material versus what we can put in our book and you know, the referencing to the renderings on that side. So we, that's a typical standard note with our pattern books to have that on there. Um, again, staff will uh, will have that review of the architecture at some point in time when the site plan comes through uh, to reevaluate and make certain that we're not going too far off basis. But what we're showing from a color rendering standpoint in regards to these materials, this is the, the general color palette that Mr. Masterson would like to use in regards to the colors and tones that you see on those elevations on the lower portions of, the, of, the, of page 14 on that side. So. He's not going to be going with any Robert hot pinks or anything like that. He definitely wants to keep it with the no pinks and more, purples. Yeah, no pinks and purples or polka dots or anything like that. He wants to keep it with a, a very good residential character that you know help it will help sell the character of the little project to potential okay. buyers. Mr. Blomley. Thank you, Ms. Jones. I think that um, we can work with Mr. Mulchan on the language to of that to probably give the planning commission a little bit better comfort level with that language. Thank you. Any other comments and questions from the Planning Commission or staff? Rob, just uh, for clarification's sake, I think it's important that we emphasize that these are townhomes and are being sold as individual units and are not being developed as apartments. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's written in there that these are for sale product only. It's on page 15. Uh, it's a uh, bullet point number three. I oh, think yeah. it's we sold under a horizontal property regime. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I just hope that protects us. And I know it doesn't matter if you're in Breckenridge or River Band or where you're at. Uh, you can always rent your property, but... Uh, the, uh, but I do think the, that on the front side, we need to make it clear that these are not intended to be purchased and used as uh, rentable properties. Uh, that's not the intent of building them there. That is correct. That's what Mr. Masterson is, is very much about wanting to get these off his hands as fast as possible on that side. And definitely for sale will be the easiest thing to do. Will there be an HOA for this uh, neighborhood? Yes. Okay. HOA will manage it then. 
by independent third party management company. Okay, good. Yes. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the Planning Commission or staff? If not, we're ready for a motion. If there are none, I'll make a motion that we approve subject to all staff comments. Second. This is Ken Halliburton. We have a motion by Mr. Salas and a second by Mr. Halliburton. So all in favor? Ms. Jaco? Garland? Aye. Mr. Halliburton? Aye. Mr. Martin? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Silas? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Hey, you remembered me this time. Hi. Chair Jones? Aye. Thank um, you. Motion passes. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Rob. Okay, moving on to our next item. Item C is a mandatory referral and right-of-way abandonment to consider abandonment of a portion of Titan Circle right-of-way and the abandonment of drainage, detention, and utility easements. Huddleston Steel Engineering, Inc. is the applicant. Ms. Rush. Good evening, Commission. Uh, you can, hear, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, this is a mandatory referral. Uh, the Planning Commission is being asked to consider abandoning a portion of Titan Circle right-of-way as well as a drainage, detention, and public utility easements. These are located west of Titan Circle and west of Wycheck Lane. Uh, the requested abandonment is to accommodate the development for Marketplace at Savannah Ridge planned unit development, which is a uh, commercial shopping center and townhome development that has been approved but not yet constructed west of this site. Uh, this is a mandatory referral being um, requested by the Planning Commission. Um, they have gone through and completed their preliminary plat and their final plat, and these abandonments were, requ or were required as part of those plat approvals. Because the request includes a public right-of-way, a public hearing is required, which is what we are holding tonight. As indicated on the map, um, the drainage easement is shown in green. Uh, you can see where that's located would be abandoned. Uh, the detention easement is in purple. The public right-of-way, Titan Circle, is in red. And the public utility easement is in blue. Uh, for this mandatory referral, staff did route this information to other city departments and utility providers regarding the impact of the proposed abandonments. And based on the responses received, staff recommends the following conditions of approval. And I will read those into the record. The first one is the right-of-way and drainage easement abandonments shall be subject to the final approval of the legal instruments by the city legal department. The applicant shall prepare and submit legal descriptions and exhibits necessary for the city legal department to draft the necessary legal instruments. The second condition is the quick claim, the quit claim deed transferring the subject right of way and easements shall be executed and recorded prior to the recording of the final plat map. Third item is, or third condition is easements necessary for relocated utilities and drainage facilities for any remaining easements in the abandoned right-of-way must be recorded simultaneously with the abandonment of the subject easements. The fourth condition is the new right-of-way configuration for Titan Circle must be recorded simultaneously with the abandonment of the subject right-of-way abandonment. Then the fifth and final condition is that all recording fees shall be paid for by the applicant. Um, some of the requirements and comments that we did get indicated that the facilities would have to be reloc relocated and new easements created and the applicant developer um, would be required for the payment of those uh, new facility locations. 
the action that we're asking of the Planning Commission tonight is to open up a public hearing, conduct a public hearing on this request, and then formulate a recommendation to the City Council. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Huddleston is also on this evening and is available for answer, question and answers as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rush. Any uh, questions from the Planning Commission before we open the public hearing? If not, we'll open the public hearing and ask if there's anybody that would like to speak on this item. Mr. Blomley or Mr. McKnight, I don't believe we had any uh, requests for this public hearing. That is correct, uh, Madam Chair, Chairwoman. There are no uh, participants for this public hearing that have registered. Okay, then we will close this public hearing and ask for any further comments or questions from the Planning Commission and or staff on this particular item. I guess my question would be for Mr. Huddleston, uh, when we uh, do a drainage easement abandonment, uh, I'm assuming that that cur currently flows water what, uh, I haven't spent my last Easter Sunday looking at flooding uh, conditions in some neighborhoods that probably uh, had some drainage issues. Uh, what, what, are, what, are, what risk are we taking when we uh, abandon a drainage easement? In my opinion, you're not really taking any risk because we have uh, designed the drainage for this development. And in fact, we have overstored stormwater uh, in our detention ponds so as to actually help the situation downstream as opposed to uh, hurting it. Uh, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Smotherman, I, I would add that a general rule where in a particular situation like this, the, the new plat for the new development that's coming in, uh, our engineers are gonna be watching over the developers and their engineers to make sure that uh, alternate uh, drainage uh, arrangements are being created that are gonna be adequate to take care of these. So uh, it's not that these are going away uh, with nothing else, they're going away as part of a new plan that'll, that will uh, have uh, uh, what everyone believes to be more than adequate drainage facility to replace these. Thank you, Mr. Ives. If there are no other questions, I make a motion that we approve. Subject to all staff comments. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Halliburton, a second by Mr. Martin. All in favor? Ms. Jacob? Ms. Garland? Aye. Mr. Halliburton? Aye. Mr. Martin? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Silas? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. And Chair Jones? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, motion passes. Mr. Huddleston, Ms. Rush, we appreciate it. Next, that, that does conclude our public hearings for tonight, and we are moving on to staff reports and other business. And our first item is to hear a report from our planning director regarding the planning department processes in response to the CDC guidelines during COVID-19 pandemic and report from assistant, assistant planning director regarding schedule changes. Mr. McKnight. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, planning commission members, just wanted to give you guys a quick update. I know during a couple of planning commissions prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we, were, we shared with you guys uh, the uh, alternative work schedule uh, that we put in place. So just want to give you an update to see, to share with you how that's going, but also thank uh, you, um, Madam Chair, for your leadership and the rest of the Planning Commission for your support um, during this, uh, during the COVID-19 and alternative 
uh, work uh, schedule as well as the meetings that we're having. So thank, thank, to, thank you to all of you. Uh, currently, we currently have all of our uh, staff working from home, uh, telecommuting. Um, currently, the last submittal we had on April the 16th, we actually did that via online um, submittal process. Uh, we feel like it went smoothly, uh, ran smoothly, smoothly, and and we were on schedule with every, with the submittals, our comments back to the uh, applicants, uh, and every, all of those things happened as. Uh, as planned. Uh, we will continue to work um, from home. Uh, currently, we have um, admin in the office uh, on a daily basis, uh, working in their space uh, and the rest of the planning department, uh, other than executive uh, director Sam Huddleston and myself working in the office. Uh, otherwise, everyone else is telecommuting um, from home. Uh, our schedules are still on, uh, on uh, going as planned. Um, uh, any submittal process, any of the, the submittal uh, deadlines, those things, we have not altered any of those and responding well to those deadlines. So uh, uh, we're having online meetings, uh, conference calls, uh, video Zoom meetings. Uh, I would believe that those uh, are running well. We're getting good feedback from the applicants and the development community uh, as a whole that those meetings are being productive and efficient. Uh, and there hasn't been any 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 slow slowing of any of the processes. So we've been pretty pleased with that. And uh, we do regularly seek feedback from development development community. Uh, and those uh, the feedback we're getting is 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 good. So we we, we will continue this. Uh, we monitor it weekly. Uh, we we follow the uh, guidelines and the guidance of uh, the mayor and the city manager. Uh, and uh, any changes to currently to how we're currently running the planning department uh, will be dictated by what we receive from uh, the mayor and the city city manager. So just want to give you guys an update and then give you an opportunity to ask any questions uh, if there are any. Any questions from anyone on the, the planning commission? Y'all have certainly been doing an absolutely awesome job. Amazing that you all can do all this by telecommuting. From our end, we, we just think we can't tell anything's different. So no, it's been tough on y'all, but thank you. Any so questions from any of the staff? Uh, one Mr. question. Sure. Have you seen any uh, slowdown or uh, uptick in housing starts or you know, you know uh warren we we we're, we started a matrix and and uh, of course how our submittal process is and how we uh, receive the uh, the the plans we're doing that on a monthly basis we'll have a better idea uh, at the end of of, of april uh, as how it is, has impacted us we did the end of um, March, uh, and, and we didn't see any changes, but that's only because uh, we were already in, in, in the middle of that um, submittal process. So I think we'll have a better idea at the end of, uh, of April as to what that really looks like. So I would prefer waiting until I could receive that data uh, from the, metri the, met the matrix that we're actually uh, tracking uh, to be able to provide planning commission with uh, uh, what we see. Okay, thank you. And, and if I could just thank the staff as well. Uh, they've done an excellent job, flexible, supportive, um, and, uh, and currently uh, keeping uh, on track with everything. So I want to publicly uh, thank the, uh, all, the, all the planning department as well. Great job by all. Thank you for that update, Mr. McKnight. Uh, did Mr. Blomley have anything regarding our schedule changes? Yes, ma'am. Just a reminder that our day planning commission meeting that was originally to be held on the 15th will be held next Wednesday, the 29th at 1 p.m. And that meeting will be conducted by Zoom. Um, our day meetings aren't typically televised, but uh, because the public will not be allowed access to the meeting as they customarily would have been if it was an in-person meeting, uh, we will be televising our, our day meeting next Wednesday. Um, our next meeting after that, so we'll have three weeks with three successive, three successive weeks with planning commission um, meetings in them. Our next planning commission night meeting will be two weeks from tonight at 6 p.m. on May the 6th. And we anticipate that to also be held via Zoom. Um, but, but stay tuned for that, um, more information to come. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Blomley. Madam Chair, if I, if I may, I will, um, uh, Mr. Russell, I, I will be able to get, get you any information that the coach department building and codes, uh, they've been tracking. I'll, I'll share it. I don't mind sharing that with, uh, with the planning commission. Um, uh, Mr. Holtz does have um, uh, permitting um, numbers and those types of things that he's been tracking. So I can share that with you guys. Great. Thank you. All right. We will move on to item B, which is a zoning ordinance amendment for section 26, off street parking, queuing and loading as regards joint use of required parking spaces. City of Murfreesboro Planning Department is the applicant. I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and take that one, Ms. Jones. Um, we have, um, over the course of the last several months, determined um, what we feel are some deficiencies in section 26 of the zoning ordinance, which deals with off-street parking, loading, and queuing. Um, specifically, uh, as we have attempted to navigate some off-site parking agreements with, uh, with applicants who were looking to utilize off-site parking to meet their minimum parking requirements, um, there have been some uh, parts of our current zoning ordinance which are a little bit problematic in implementing that. And, and you know, we want to be flexible and we want to um, seek creative outside the box solutions um, that, are, that are also practical, of course. Um, but our current ordinance kind of hamstrings us a little bit in, in allowing those, those, uh, those solutions. Uh, for example, one, one main item that really that really hamstrings us is the fact that offsite parking um, agreements the the uh, the offsite parking lot that is proposed to be used to meet minimum parking requirements has to be in is required to be in the same ownership as the parcel that is seeking its use and that basically eliminates about 99 percent of the situations where someone will want to use um, an offsite parking location um, to meet their minimum parking requirements because almost almost never would the would the offsite parking lot that is attempted to be used to satisfy those requirements in the same ownership as the as the parking lot that that needs the the additional parking and so we've taken that opportunity to um, to really improve our our offsite the provisions for offsite parking agreements um, and we've also um, while we've done that, we've also looked kind of comprehensively at what else in Section 26 needs to be uh, cleaned up in staff's opinion. Um, one of the things that um, that we looked at was putting some um, uh, standards in place. You know, as you know, when we get townhome developments for review, in many instances, the townhome developments look to utilize garage parking to meet their minimum parking requirements. Um, we have allowed that kind of casually over the last um, several years uh, because we want to encourage uh, garage parking as opposed to um, as opposed to on or not on street parking but um, uh, parking lots for for townhome developments but but we also want to make sure that those that those garages are large enough to to allow for both the parking of vehicles and if there are if they're storing garbage cans in there, water heaters, um, we want to make sure that they're practical. So, so we've we've put some standards in there. So, the, so now that staff and the planning commission have have standards to look at when people want to utilize that garage parking to meet their minimum parking requirements. So it's another effort to be to be flexible, um, but to also have some common sense uh, standards to apply when someone wishes to take advantage of that. And we've also um, done a few other things in there and uh, cleaned up some some terminology that was outdated, um, uh, put um, percentage caps on the number of narrow spaces that that are allowed. Right now, our our zoning ordinance has an eight and a half foot wide stall option, um, and what we are proposing is to cap that at twenty percent. Except if you're in the CCO, then to have it, um, 
had there not be a cap for the uh, the narrower parking spaces um, to allow as much flexibility in the CCO as possible. So we know that there are a lot of infill developments that need that flexibility. So we really tried to take this opportunity to, um, to make some improvements to section 26. Um, Mr. Ives has worked very hard on this as has our planning staff worked very hard on, on, on these changes. So uh, we would request that um, you schedule a public hearing if, if you feel comfortable in moving forward with the proposed changes to schedule a public hearing for May 6th. That's our next night meeting. We only have one additional public hearing scheduled that night and that's for an amendment to the West Lawn plan development. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I will say that there are a couple of blanks that we're still working on that we left blank, literal, bl literal blanks in the proposed uh, amendment that we will work on and uh, fill in those blanks before the agenda for the May 6th meeting goes out if you choose to schedule this for the, uh, the May 6th agenda. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Blomley. Any questions uh, for Mr. Blomley from any of the Planning Commission? And if not, I think he would like us to schedule a public hearing for May 6th. Halliburton being asked a question. Mr. Halliburton. Mr. Blomley. So uh, if, the, if we had a planned development, um, would it, it's not going to pr uh, preclude the applicant from being able to utilize the garage spaces as the count towards the requirement uh, since it is a planned development. Is that true or not? Mr. Halliburton, it would allow garages to count towards the minimum parking requirements, whether it was a planned development or uh, or bulk zoning like RSA type two. What what we're trying to do is we've been kind of casually allowing that for for several years because we want to encourage garage parking. Um, but right now, what we don't have is our, our standards, and so we've been kind of saying, okay. Um, uh, we would like you to restrict it via restrictive covenants so that the HOA can 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 say, hey, you, you can only use this for parking. You can't use it for storage boats and RVs, things like that. And, you know, we would say, hey, show us a diagram that you can fit two full size vehicles in there, as opposed to actually having some standards in our ordinance that we can point to and say, your garage needs to be this minimum size in order to be a functional garage to have a to fit two full size vehicles in there, a garbage can and a water heater, and we've also put a clause in there saying that if you are using garages to count towards your minimum parking requirements, then if you use them for other purposes, then it's expressly stated that that would be a violation of the uh, of the zoning ordinance. Right. Okay. And I, I understood that. I was just reading the ordinance. And, and you're right, it specifically states what zoning can have, um, you can use the uh, garage count as part of the count, but anything other than that, it looks like it's prohibited. Um, but I was just making sure that a, from a plan development standpoint, it, a plan development would not be uh, outside of, of the verbiage. And what I'm specifically looking at is uh, it's C number five and it reads parking spaces within garages whether attached to or detached from the principal structure shall not be considered as required parking spaces for the purposes of this section and then it outlines the specific zones that can use you see what I'm trying to say so it's everything you can't count them unless it's part of this zone. So I'm, you've answered my question, but from a plan development standpoint, you would have that option uh, to count them. That's correct. Yeah, with, okay. with a plan development, um, you can basically write your own okay. into the pattern book. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Sure. Okay. Any any other questions? 
Sorry, Mr. Halliburton, I didn't see your hand up. Anybody else? Okay, then we'll ask for a motion for a public hearing on May 6th. I'll make a motion to set a public hearing for May 6th. Second. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Motion by Ms. Garland and a second by Mr. Salas, I believe. So all in favor, Ms. Jaco? Ms. Garland? Aye. Mr. Halliburton? Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. Mr. Silas? Aye. Mr. Smetherman? And Madam Chair Jones? Aye. Okay, motion passes. So we have a public hearing set for May 6th. All right, and our next item under staff reports and other business. Before we can even talk about this, I have to say how much the city of Murfreesboro certainly loves and misses Mr. Doug Young. Loved all his years on the planning commission. I know the staff, the whole planning department, as well as city council and the city of Murfreesboro, we miss him dearly. So item C is the Doug Young Public Safety Training Center architectural elevations for public safety training facility buildings on 8.79 acres zoned RM16 located along New Salem Highway and Bridge Avenue, City of Murfreesboro developer, Mr. Cooper. Thank you very much, Chair Jones. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on this development, uh, it was approved in 2007 with the expectation that it would be completed in phases. Uh, there was a condition placed upon it saying that with every new phase that were, were to be presented to uh, staff that it come through planning commission to be uh, looked at for elevations. Uh, so today we are going to look at the elevations for the project. I don't know if they were included uh they, they were my my adobe acrobat reader is not responding close parentheses okay I, I mean i'll keep talking uh uh so this is phase two for the k9 trainee support building it's uh it, it's got a little pavilion on it it there, there's not much to the building not to say that it's not a significant building but uh it's uh there there is stone on the side um uh, you, you should have it all in your uh, documents. Uh, if you want to have any comments or questions directed toward me or Mr. McKnight, I know has worked on this extensively as well. So uh, I'm open to any questions. Did anyone have any, any questions for Mr. Cooper or Mr. McKnight on this item? And what are we looking for from the Planning Commission tonight on this? Do we need a motion on anything? Or are we scheduling something moving forward? Yeah, we would desire, uh, Madam Chair, a motion to approve the project and move forward with construction. I would also like to add that there are no staff comments associated with this. Staff has already worked out everything that needs to be worked out previously. I'm sure it's perfect. And just to, as a, a background, this project has been um, um, working and in progress and waiting on contracts and approved by the um, um, council, um, I believe uh, four months ago, five months ago, and I'll get the exact date on that, but this has been approved and presented to the uh, uh, council uh, as well. OK, 
Okay. Mr. Blomley, did you have any other comments or questions? He's still working on it. Any other questions or comments from the Planning Commission? And if not, we're, I believe. Ms. Jones, I believe I, I believe I can get that back up if, if anybody would like to see it. Here we go. I had to re reboot the PDF. I think it's that's what we're looking at right there. The Planning Commission back when they approved the site plan, not all the elevations for all the buildings were available at that time. And so that's that's why um, we'll be coming back to you with each with each the elevations for each building. Okay, thank you. Comments or questions from the Planning Commission? If there are if there are none, I'll make a motion that we approve. Second. Motion, Mr. Halliburton, and second by Mr. Smotherman. All in favor? All in favor. Jacob. Ms. Garland. Aye. Mr. Halliburton? Aye. Mr. Martin? Aye. <clears throat> Mr. Russell? Uh, aye. Mr. Silas? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Madam Chair Jones? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you all very much. And that does conclude the staff reports and other business that were actually printed on our agenda. Any other staff reports or other business? Mr. McKnight or Mr. Blomley? Mr. Ives? I have nothing. None at this time, Madam Chair. Uh, except I would say thank you to planning staff and also to the communication staff who has put all those together. Uh, I just showed up. Uh, the technology and, and the planning that went into making this all possible was, was done by others, and I thank them for it, and I appreciate their effort. Uh, and thank you to all the planning commissioners also for uh, participating in this and, and making this happen. It's amazing we can get these kind of things done, isn't it? But yeah, great job by everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, and guys. Thank you. Any, any other business? And if not, thank you very much. Everybody have a great evening and we stand adjourned. <laughs>